So good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour. This is a program entitled Diversity for Diversity's Sake or The Answer to Implicit Bias. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities and uh, our center is happy to bring you these weekly Medical Center Hour programs that are designed to um, stretch us um, intellectually and uh, to broaden our view and put us in conversation uh, with each other on a variety of topics. Um, in the US in recent years, increasing workforce diversity has become a priority in healthcare as well as in other industries. Many companies, including Fortune 500 companies, now recognize that having a diverse workforce improves both business and the bottom line. Indeed, diversity is understood to be a key to organizational excellence. In this Medical Center Hour, we have a panel of faculty and resident physicians um, who together will explore whether UVA Health System's growing diversity might enrich us and add value in yet another way. Can our organization's increasing diversity serve as a lever to mitigate bias? These are fraught times in our country and in our community, especially in the wake of the events of last August, but really going back before then. And our city's name, Charlottesville, has become code for confrontations over explicit expressions of racism and bias. In this moment and going forward, how might we use our health system's growing diversity to actively address and better understand bias in our midst? and to change in very practical ways how we value and treat one another. Our panelists today are opening a challenging conversation that will need to continue and will need to involve each one of us across and throughout our organization. How we come together to share and learn from our rich array of perspectives, how we come to acknowledge and engage our various experiences will determine how best we bring UVA forward. So I'm, I'm happy to welcome today Michael Williams, uh, Associate Professor in the Departments of Surgery and Public Health Sciences and Director of the UVA Center for Health Policy, a joint effort of the School of Medicine and the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy here at UVA. Um, next to him is Gerald Donowitz, Professor in the Department of Medicine. Uh, next to Dr. Donowitz, Dr. Charles Friel, Associate Professor in the Department of Surgery. Um, and uh, next to Dr. Friel, Pooja Shah Berry, resident physician in the Department of Surgery, and we will also uh, be joined by uh, another resident in surgery, uh, Alla, Dr. Allison Martin. Um, so I will turn this over to Mike Williams, and we'll have this hour, and toward the end of the hour, we will also, or maybe interactively uh, throughout the program, um, you all have mics, and you all have voices, and you all have views. And we look forward to this hour uh, starting this conversation. So welcome. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm a walker, so you'll forgive me. I'm going to walk around as we talk. Um, and we're going to have a conversation. This is not at all uh, to be a, a monologue by, by Mike Williams. But I want to kind of dovetail off of something Dr. Children just, just said. I'm going to read something from my, my UVA or my Apple news feed today. See if you can guess who said this. Quote, there's so much research that shows that you need diverse teams to do the best work. So it's important that we do better on diversity, not only because it's the right thing to do for the country and for people, but because that's the only way we're going to serve our community the best. Who do you think said that? What industry leader said that? What industry is this person in? It's not healthcare. I'll give you a hand. I don't care. It's Mark Zuckerberg. For Facebook guy, for those who don't know his name, right? The guy who started Facebook or not, depending if you read the, the movie or not. Um, Facebook has figured this out, uh, that the way to excellence, almost uniquely, I hope to convince you, goes through a diverse path. Um, that uh, a, a monologue of ideas leads to missed opportunities. And so the question I have for us today as a group, and I'll be asking our panelists, their, their thoughts on this is, how do we tackle the rising rhetoric in our country? How do we address these things? And we can have meetings like this. We can have dialogue. 
we can have legal intervention, we can have public discourse. But in the end, those are not necessarily actions. What are the actions that we can take that can help us move forward? And I want to frame this in a different way than I think most people do. My question to you and to our panelists is, what's the value of diversity? Because let's face it, for the School of Medicine, the university in general, there are certain boxes we have to check. Right? There are happily laws in place, in my view, happily laws in, in place that make us <coughs> at least pay lip service to diversity. But I'm here to tell you that's not enough to actually change the conversation in this country. And we in the healing professions have a much bigger challenge. Does anybody know by what year people of color will be equal in number to people of not color in this country? Guesses. 40? 20. 40. 40 is the estimate. So that's tomorrow. Okay. Essentially tomorrow there will be equal number of people, adults, and children living in this country who look like me on the outside than look like Dr. Jones on the outside. So that's a reality that we have to understand because people of color in this country have a different lived experience on average than people who are not of color, people who are in the white majority, who will soon be the white minority. And so the conversation begins to switch. Who is here on August 12th, besides me and all these folks? Yeah. So August 12th is an important day for us, obviously, and as Dr. Children said, we are the synonym right now globally for acts of racially based hatred. If you didn't know that, let me be the first to tell you. If you ask anybody around the world, I read a story in NPR months after in Germany talking about Nazis and the, and the far right's rise in Nazi Germany, in Germany right now. And they talked about Charlottesville in the same sentence. So I want you to understand that this is pretty, this is a big deal, right? We as a community have to overcome that barrier. But I want to have a conversation today with, with our panelists here that have little to do with August 12th. <coughs> it has more to do with our history, and we heard a great grand rounds in our department um, last week, I believe, it was a week ago uh, today, about some of the really horrible things. I mean, just capital E, evil things that this medical school took part in in and around the time of the Civil War. Horrible, horrible things. So our legacy here, locally, is unique. So how do we overcome that? And my answer to this is where the money is. It's a value proposition. We have to provide proof to the broader community that there is greater value in a diverse world than a less diverse world. And so my question to our panelists is, in your unique perspective, so I'll just give you a little bit of, a, of an insight here. We have two program director and former program director and two major departments here at the School of Medicine and a current chief resident um, in my department of surgery. So people who have been here a second, people who have seen a great deal of things, and people who are responsible for recruiting others to come to UVA to learn their professions and to change the world, because that's what we do. And so, Jerry, I'll start with you. In, from your perspective, what value is there in diversity? Are we just checking boxes? Is there more to it? What that tells us, or told us, is that we can't control the national elections. I can't control the state elections. We can't con control the national community. But the community that we actually do have control over is ours within this hospital, in this medical center. And all of a sudden, it's, OK, if that's the outside, what do we want to do for the inside? And so the questioning really starts to come there, that, you know, is it important? Absolutely. Our patient population is diverse. It's going to get more diverse, as you pointed out. And the initial thought 20 years ago, I'm sure, I was here 20 years ago, was, you know, we're doctors, we care about our patients, that's the most important thing. But James Baldwin, who is, a, for the younger people, was a great writer in the 50s and 60s, made the statement that if you are a Negro in America, and conscious, then most of the time you will be in a rage. And that's true. When we had a town hall meeting after the election, the medical students were in one corner, minority uh, faculty were together, and the stories they told about these microaggressions and the response to them 
told me that we weren't doing our job, that we thought we were doing some sort of job, but we were not. And the conversation began of, wait, what? This is happening here? This is before August 12th. And the issue of creating an environment that's fair, that's equal, you can't have that without diversity. And all of a sudden, it became much more important to say, we have to do this. So if we want a medical center that treats all sorts of patients with understanding, then the doctors that are doing that have to be as diverse as the patient population, A. And B, if we want our house staff and nutritionists and people working in the cafeteria and people cleaning the floors and cleaning the windows and neurosurgeons to be comfortable here, they can't be the only people who look this way or that way. That's another layer. We have to say we want our patients to be comfortable. And we can't assume that because I'm a really caring physician that someone who's been offended by the white race for 30 years as their family members have been will feel very comfortable with me. Why would I assume that? So that's one layer. And the other is layers that we want everyone to feel comfortable here, including the physicians and everyone else. So diversity is extremely important from that view. So that's the easy answer. John, your perspective. Um, I think of something smart to say as you go through this, but uh, but it's also a diversity of ideas, and um, you know I'm, I'm just you know going back to our twelfth and August twelfth in, in a way it was a horrible day, but it's also this incredible opportunity we've been given, right, to to start this conversation. I'm thinking about this a totally different way than I did on August tenth, honestly. Um, so we need to take full advantage of that. But part of that is that diversity of ideas so that when I went to the first town hall meeting, you know, I, had, I felt a certain way. And the truth is I felt the way of a 50-year-old white guy who just goes to work a lot, who doesn't, you know, just doesn't really know my home and my the hospital and one road from between the two places and doesn't think about the world too much because I've got a lot of work to do. And then I heard other people talk about it. And I thought, wow. There's different perspectives. There's a different viewpoint. There's a different, and if that room had been full of me and a lot of people like me, we would have had the same reaction, which was this was not Charlottesville. This was invasion. This is they just upset our, our town, blah, 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 blah. And we would have missed the point. So, but it took a lot of brave people who look different from me to come to express different ideas for me to say, okay. You know, maybe I didn't get it. You know, and and so so without those diverse thoughts, I never get past who I am. And it doesn't make me. I don't make me a bad person. I just didn't think about it. And so I think we need that. And I think as we were talking, I was thinking historically. My dad used to talk about this, and we were watching a movie with I don't know with uh, in the '60s about the Vietnam War and McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, and my my dad, who was kind of in that business said, you know, the fundamental flaw back then was they had a bunch of white guys in a room, all Harvard trained, talking about the Vietnam War. And they never really asked anybody from Asia, like, what's the problem, what are the issues? And they would just make bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. And I think if they had had a group, of, 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 of a diverse group with diverse thoughts, perhaps we would have made very different decisions on a national level. So we can't surround ourselves with with, um, I think, people that, that look a lot together and think a lot together because we're just going to perpetuate some of the same mistakes that we've made over and over and over again. And, uh, and I think it's important to realize that that doesn't make people evil. It just makes, it's just, it's just, it's just natural, I think. If you have no diversity of thought, then you don't venture out of your comfort zone. So that's, I guess, for that's the diversity for diversity's sake. And, and then, of course, like from a selfish standpoint now as program director, I, I think my, my thought is I'm trying to get the best people to come. And I, whether it's, uh, in, you know, I think when we had this discussion about women, you know, 20 years ago, you know, people started asking the question, well, if you want the best people to come, you can't exclude 50% of the population, <laughs> right? Um, and so that's what we were doing for years and years and years and years when we didn't have higher education, you know, these institutions weren't open to women and things like that. So we just need to be able to broaden our horizons. Now, those conversations are super uncomfortable. 
I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing it already. And, and, and you try to do the right thing and, you know, and three people were slapping you on the back and telling you you're doing a great job and three are telling you, like, what are you thinking about? Or, or like, or saying this isn't right. I don't know. There's a lot. Of, it's not as, like, it's hard to have these conversations. So... Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with, you know, the thoughts that were expressed by um, Dr. Friel and, uh, and this gentleman over there. But um, one thing I will say, which is a we positive... Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. He thought I was a PGY1, so it's okay. <laughs> um, one positive thing that I want to say is when I first started here six and a half years ago, I looked at... Um, all of the pictures of the house staff across all of the departments. And quite frankly, it looked very vanilla. There were very few people that looked like me or different. And now when I look at all of the house staff pictures, which sounds a little creepy, but I do look at departments from time to time, there's a huge amount of diversity now. I mean, I'm so thrilled to see the change that has been brought about in like the general house staff hiring. and. Um, you know, just to piggyback off of what Dr. Friel said, I think truly diversity brings fresh ideas and fresh perspectives and new ways of doing things that might be better. Like one analogy I really like is when for, for many, many years, I don't know, hundreds of years or, or however long heparin has been around, we always used a certain lab to measure heparin levels. And then all of a sudden, last year, we were told well, this is not actually the right test, and there was no science behind this, and we shouldn't have been doing this, and we should do this other thing. There's also not great science behind this, but we're going to do this now. And it's sort of similar. I mean, just because you've been doing something one way for many years does not make it the right way. Thank you. Um, I'm going to change topics a little bit. Uh, I'm going to change topics a little bit, but I, I want to... Thought, think if there are any feedback or comments from the, from the audience. Because I, I know some of you by name, so I will call on you um, if, if not volunteered. Um, but I, I'm hoping that we can have an interactive um, session today. Um, so I, I, I want to challenge the panelists. Um, a, I agree with all your comments. But B, I want to challenge the panelists. So what do we get? Pooja points out that the programs have diversified over the time that she's been here, six and a half years, and Jerry's been here a couple years longer than that, and Charlie's been here a couple years longer than that. What have we, what have we, what have we gotten? What's changed? Is something better materially? Can we measure that? Can we tell the next generation of residents, applicants for a nursing school, medical school, um, the pharmacy residency program, that UVA is materially better because we are more diverse? Are you asking how we got more diverse, or what? No, I'm going to get to that in a second. Yeah. But the question I'm asking now is: so we're more diverse. So what? How think, are we better? Why yeah. is that good? I think the conversations that now are being held are much easier to have. You know, if you have one minority resident in your group, you say, "What's it? What's it like?" <laughs> you know, all of a sudden, that one person, no matter who it is, is now the spokesperson for that race, that gender. That's a big deal, and that's one person's view. If you have diversity in all shapes and sizes and colors, you can have an open conversation without feeling that I represent this or that. And the fact that you have that, all of a sudden, the conversations are easier. You can talk about the meaningful conversations in a reasonable way without putting everybody in this under some sort of spotlight. Because I'm not the only one. I'm one of many. Let's talk about it. The fact that there's a minority house staff council developed in the last year, we can get back to how that developed, all of a sudden it gives house staff who are underrepresented minorities a place to feel comfortable in talking about house staff issues, which always have to talk, be talked about if the programs are going to get better. So in any number of ways, I think it's improved what we do for a living as far as medical school training and house staff training. There's no question. Anybody else? I I I want. Are, are you asking um, like a little more hard, like hard, hardcore? What we getting? 
and 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 I'm you know maybe I'm wrong, but but I think again if and I'm this is I'm gonna try to put it down. I'm be selfish right here. Like so again, I'm, if I'm trying to attract Pooja Shah to come here, right? That's my job, right? Is to attract the best to come here. And Pooja looks at a, a picture and sees no one like her. I think it's gonna be a lot harder to get Pooja Shah to come here. So so it, it, and if that's I mean, so I'm not I'm like you know trying to be I'm, and I think that's what you're asking like what are we actually getting like as opposed to it's a big you know a nice world and we are the world and all that stuff I mean what's the concrete stuff we're getting that's the type of stuff we're getting right we're we're able to now recruit and retract and other people that might have been not so keen on coming here okay. you know Carlin Williams or whatever you know he's in the, and we've heard that right we've heard. We've heard um, uh, young men and women of color who've come here, you know, and and their parents tell them like, "What are you doing? Like, why are you going there?" And they're coming here because they want to do a cool I six program or a cool four three program, and they trust that that's going to be okay. But they come with trepidation. So what we really want to do is we want them to come with enthusiasm, right? So I think we get that. I think you know if you're looking at you know, positioning ourselves in the healthcare environment and we're trying to track patients, right? That's, you know, we're trying to do that all the time. You're in those rooms all the time. How do we move into that market? How do we move into that market? And as you pointed out, if the world's starting to look not, you know, if we're just a white supremacist hospital, <laughs> like, you know, from a marketing perspective, we're not going to survive either. So, so I think that's what you're asking to some extent. Um, it's not just about just, you know, you know just to do it because we think it's a good idea, which is also what's a good idea. But there are some practical parts that if we're going to survive, we have to figure out how we're going to be exist in the world that's diverse by definition, in a country that's diverse, and getting more so, as you just pointed out. So that's a little bit, I mean, I don't know if that's what it, I mean, it sounds like, I don't want to be to make it too practical, but that is an element. I think that's what you're driving at a little bit. So. It absolutely is. It absolutely is. And Pooja, I'm going I'm to get to your thoughts on this. But to, to echo what both Jerry and Charlie just said, I, I want to make, and that's why I quoted Zuckerberg to begin this discussion. This is a business imperative for us. I just could put it bluntly. This is a business imperative for the University of Virginia. Forget the health system. The whole university has to get better at this. Because if we don't, we will cease to exist. It's just that simple. And P.S. I would I would argue that we were the whites. I mean, you know, like that's that's what our history is, right? Historically, we were the center of that movement. I mean, I'm talking about you know, long long time ago, but we have to not be that center anymore. And that's why I think that when it happens in Charlottesville, it's a big deal because we have that history. And I, just to, to frame the business imperative piece, because I've discovered, I'm 50 as well, that um, almost everybody cares about money. People have different faiths, they have different credos, they have different beliefs, they live in different parts of the world, but there's almost nobody that doesn't really care about having enough money. Right? So the common denominator, the common language for any conversation that you really have to move forward has to be about where the money's going to go. So if we don't diversify, and this is where I think the punchline is for today's conversation, if we don't diversify our workforce and attract the patients who are going to live in our community and do now, but are going to live in our community and grow and grow in numbers, and by the way, our community is going to be the size of the Commonwealth of Virginia soon, right? Within five years, there's no question, we will be reaching across the entire Commonwealth in a very meaningful way. If you didn't know that, news flash. That's where we're headed. We have to. Because there are market forces that are, bay, that, are, uh, that are at play that will make us do that one way or the other, either on our terms or somebody else's. So it's a business imperative that we have to be able to connect to every community that we need to connect to, which is all of them. Vanderbilt figured this out. Hopkins, Jerry, would you, would you mind showing, and please, I promise I'm going to get back to you, but would you mind showing everybody the, the very glossy? The very glossy, very large diversity and inclusion, which goes. 40, 50 pages Annual report. of what Hopkins is doing. Um, why I was sent this is not clear to me. <laughs> Man. So if you'll, it's, this is from Johns Hopkins. It was mailed to Dr. Donowitz, and it says, diversity inclusion, annual report. You think it matters to Johns Hopkins? They mailed it randomly. Did you go to Hopkins for anything? My brother's a chief of GI and head of the research. Yeah, he's, he's got, he, that's a gotcha. He's, he's trying to tell you something there, Jerry. 
right? Our neighbor up the road, not that far away, has done this and is touting this. Well, that, that's a white guy on the car. It is. Right. <laughs> and I don't know who he is. Um, he needs a shave, but um, he, who he is kind of doesn't matter, right? For all I know, he's, he's a gay immigrant from Saskatchewan. I, you know, I don't know. Doesn't really matter. But that's kind of the point, right? It's diversity and inclusion. And so this is a really critically important part of the conversation. Because I will tell you that it's not the job of the brown people, Bougie and I and others, to educate the non-brown people. Right? There, I think there is this, this often misperception out there that it's, it's our job. And Charlie, I think you alluded to this earlier. Like, who? Show of hands, what year was the first African-American member of the faculty of the Department of Surgery brought to UVA? Your lifetime, the last five years, last century, guesses? Yeah, you're looking at it. You're looking at it. <laughs> Me, in 2012, I'm the first. Which is crazy, right? And I, I actually didn't believe that. I actually had a predecessor of Pujas, who is now a cardiac surgeon in Kansas, tell me I was the first one ever. And I said, it can't be. It's 2012. There's a black president, for Pete's sake. It can't be. Yeah, sure enough. I'm not the last, though. We've Carlin Williams joined the faculty this year, and we've, we've got a, um, a black um, clinical faculty member right now. So, you know, we figured it out in our department. This is good news. Medicine figured it out, right? We, we figured these things out. But then the question becomes, how do we get there, right? Because I think we proved challenge one of the things you said, though. Let me ask. Yes, please. So Hopkins is in Baltimore. Many, many hospitals there. Yeah, D.C., Phoenix. Right. <laughs> Vanderbilt, which put on a large program and saw a 2 or 3% increase in their monies. Nashville, many hospitals. Charlottesville, Central Virginia, we're the hospital. There's MCV. There's Martha Jeff. I, I'm not sure that that's the reason to do it. I mean, I'm not, it may be a reason, yeah. but we are the hospital that people in Central Virginia will come to. Yeah. So here's, here's, here's the, the answer to your question, yep. um, and I'm sorry to cut you off. The answer to your question is that we are not competing with any of the places you mentioned if over the next two, three years. We're not. VCU is not going to compete with us and vice versa. Richmond is its own crazy market of 12 different hospitals, and they're going to be on their own little island. We're competing with everybody else in this coast. Right? We're competing with Duke, who's got stuff all over the place. Right? Wake Med's got stuff all over the place. That's who we're competing with. We're competing with, with Inova for the moment, right, who's got a million lives in the county of Fairfax alone. So a third of the people who live in our state <laughs> live in Fairfax County. <laughs> okay? So where the humans are is where we have to be competitive. And there's a relatively small number of humans here, although we are a growing population of humans. We have a 12% population growth here in Albemarle County over the last 10 years. 12%. Still not a lot of people in the grand scheme of things. But Growing, but, but, but I don't. Do I don't think, and I think beyond. You know, I, I, this is the uncomfortable part of this. I feel. I feel like there's a little uncomfortableness right now. Honestly, I, I don't think any. I don't think Mike's saying there's not a moral imperative as oh, well. No, yeah. Right. Well, I, I just. I think he's just pointing out that there is. Also there's also. Yeah. It's also like if you're just thinking in practical terms, it, it is beyond just that we think it's a good idea. You know, it, it is the key to our survival, right? So, but I don't think for a second you're not <laughs> arguing that even if we didn't have these financial interests, that we shouldn't do this for, yeah, no. for, as true. a moral imperative. Yeah. And I, so, I don't want that message to feel like that's the overriding message. No, and, and please don't don't take that right. I don't think. Yeah. Right. Um, again, I, I my my deep belief and experience is that people care about money, and so if you make the the argument to anybody, even the people who hate you because you're you, and you because you're you, or you because you're not six feet tall, right? Or, or you because you're gay, or you because you come from another country. If they hate you for no apparent reason, they all still care about money, right? Bottom line, no one doesn't care about money. And so I've, I've stopped trying to convince people of the moral rightness of this, because I think the people in the audience who came to this conversation probably drank that Kool-Aid. I'll have to convince. I know good half of you. And I don't have to convince any of the moral rightness of this argument. But that is not who I'm trying to convince. I'm trying to help you go forward and convince those who aren't so sure about this. That if they care about nothing else, they probably want their job. They want food on the table. They want health insurance. Can, can I just make one comment, Dr. Please. Williams? 
So, but I think the difficulty in that, I hear what you're saying, I, I understand what you're saying, but at the end of the day, when you bring people in for diversity purposes, how do you do that with the business imperative in mind and yet do it so that the people who don't maybe look like Dr. Friel don't also feel that undertone of this is a business imperative? Like, how do you meld those together and make them feel like they actually want to be here? Because they think then, you know, otherwise you risk the, you have the risk of marginalizing those people further sure. Sure. and saying like, well, am I here because I got like extra brownie points because I'm like a short brown girl and like we don't have many of those in surgery, you know? Yeah. So I have, I have an answer and then I would love to hear and I'll get, get to your, your question. My answer to you is I don't want to bring anybody here for diversity's sake. It's not the reason to do it. Right? Don't bring me here because I'm six feet tall and have brown skin. Bring me here because I'm good at what I do and I add value to something you need. Recognizing that part of my value is that I'm of some height and have brown skin. Because I, I grew up in the burbs outside of DC. I don't know anything about living in anybody's urban ghetto. I don't know anything about that world. Right? I cannot speak for all people of color in this country. My dad's from the Caribbean. He's a British citizen for half his life. Completely different lived experience than many people who are generationally trapped in poverty in this country. I'm not gay. I have no idea what that's like. You should bring me here because I bring value. What I'm asking us to do is recognizing that part of my value is all of who I am. Right? Part of my value is all of who I am, not just what I look like. So I would agree with you, Pooja, completely. We should never bring anybody here to check a box. We should never, ever recruit just to make sure that we look a certain way in the, in the book. Every single person has to be able to, to, to punch at their weight. Right? Because we run this, I've, I've had that conversation for years where, oh, you're only here because. I was an athlete in college. So I was only here because I played soccer. <laughs> I go to class, right? I go to class like you do. Right? I, I have to get the same grade. I have the same professor you do. It's the same class. So, right? so, so I think this is, time I, I, I'm glad Pooja brought this up because I do think there's, and I don't know the right answer, and I'm not going to pretend I know the right answer, but I'll probably say something that will get me in trouble. <laughs> um, but, but I think that there is, there is a burden that we all have to pay a little bit as we try to sort this out, right? And the the and I talked to my wife about this because I you know I said like this is some feelings I'm getting and she said you know what people say that I've been dealing with that my whole life like I'm a woman in the, in the architecture you know every time I can do, get to do anything someone says it's just because I'm a woman right and she said, I just had to like learn to deal with it and just accept the fact that I'm there because I'm supposed to be there whereas the other side of this I'm getting is it's not fair to the white male like me. I'm like, well, you know, well, I don't know what to tell you. Like, like the world, like we're all, you know, you're, you're, you're going to do fine. Like you're not like being shut out of the world, right? You know, and, and like don't be such a victim about it, I guess. But so I don't know how we feel, make, do with those feelings because I don't, I think they're somewhat, they're real. I mean, they're real feelings. Um, and, and that's the uncomfortable part about it all, right? But that's because, the argument for diversity, really. You would argue that you want to be diverse in every way. Right, but like, I guess hopefully... You're good, you're here. But this is, I think, what Mike's next is how do we get there, right? So I think the goal is that, like, we're there, and once we're there, we don't have to have these uncomfortable feelings, but as we're emerging and doing and st struggling with this, there's going to... I don't see how we get around some uncomfortable feelings. Yes. Well, we can't, right? Right. You, you don't make sausage cleanly. It's a, it's a process. And you had a... I had a question about the implicit bias. Hold the mic. Hold it. I had a question about implicit bias because a lot of uh, diversity does occur when in hiring decisions, and therefore, uh, you know, what what role do we have as professionals in calling out our um, our colleagues or pointing out that there may be some bias? Um, in, in making these decisions while we're trying to address diversity? Program directors? Or not? I think, as you said, well, let me take a step back. The Department of Medicine was the first department to actually have training in implicit bias. We say, you know, I don't like people with mustaches, so I don't think 
found out he's going to get a job. Yeah, he'll do something else. But you have to recognize that it exists. And if you recognize that it exists, then you're free to say, oh, you know, I think you're not really looking at this person correctly. And the fact that we're all talking about it makes it very easy in large groups to say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I think what you just said is not really fair. And I think saying it now, I think you're in a great position. So I think having those conversations, people call them real conversations or honest conversations. I think if you see it, calling it, this is the right atmosphere, this is the right media, right culture to have that done successfully. Um, Cam Webb gave a great talk on um, second visits for underrepresented minorities. And he wrote in a blog that he, before he had been in Charlotte at UVA, long enough to know where the shortcut to the cafeteria was, he was referred to as nigger by a patient. This is on a blog that he's writing about, very articulately. But he's talking in front of a group of underrepresented minorities saying, yeah, and I dealt with it, and I was able to deal with it, and this is exactly now at UVA the right culture to be able to deal with it. And the microaggressions that we heard about when Trump was elected, we were all amazed. But now the departments, and I say all the departments, are getting together to say, how are we, we as a group, going to deal with microaggressions when we see it? It was an embarrassment to say that 50% of the time we asked the students, wasn't there an attending with you? Yeah, about half the time. And did they say anything? Yeah, about half the time. And it's, that's not the answer you want. That's not the answer I expected. But now with what we're learning on how to do our business, yeah, I think bringing up that challenge is exactly the right thing to do. Uh, kind of going off of what you were just saying, uh, we can talk about how the patient population is incredibly diverse, but we have to be aware that the pendulum kind of swings in the other direction. I had a patient that refused blood uh, from someone that was not of his heritage. I've heard of medical students that have had really uncomfortable comments said to them. And then while I was on the interview trail uh, this year, I've had people look at me and they say, oh, you're from UVA? I did an interview with them because of Charlottesville. So it's not just the, um, as much as we try from the employee perspective, what can we do from the patient perspective? Because I think that's kind of a dynamic that it might be difficult to control because it's kind of our job, ethically, morally, to treat them regardless. So what do we do with those microaggressions? I, I, I think the first, you know, I, the first the first thing you do is you act like a professional, right? And you show them like you're. You, I mean, I think that's critical, right? You, you. I mean, you're right. You do have a job, and I'm not saying we shouldn't say anything. I'm not saying we shouldn't do stuff. But you know, Pooja Shaw was on call that day, right? And 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 Allison Martin was on call that day. She's not here, but you know, and it was a horrible day for them, you know. But at the end of the day. She did her job. She tried to resuscitate that poor woman. And there was, you know, I don't know, there was people with tattoos and stuff like that. And it's hard for me to imagine, at least I, I hope, I believe, that someone can't look at that and say, wow, like, look at this person who I have these preconceived notions of, and they're like, you know, amazing. So I, I do think we, that's the first thing we do. Now that might be overly simplistic. But it does seem like we just got to be really, we have to be good. Yeah. Well, I, I would agree that, that you take care of the patient that needs taken care of. Um, I also think that, and we're, we're, what, a year and a half later now, yeah. Jerry? We're, we're on the cusp of having a tool delivered to all of you in the room um, to answer that question. All right, so we've got some video vignettes that, are, that have been developed over many months. Um, that you will all have access to as, as training tools to help you in that situation, in situations like that. Um, <clears throat> it's taken, frankly, too long. There, I said it on the record. Um, it's taken too long. Um, you know, I, Jerry and I have been part of this process, and, and I think he'll speak for himself, but it's been very frustrating because 
I don't want two more seconds to go by that you don't have the answer to your question. That you can literally say, this is what we do at UVA with this. Um, we, it, do, it doesn't mean what I'm saying. You, don't, you should never take abuse. Like, right. that's not what I'm saying. Um, but but I think we have to be above the, we, but you know the, like if you're gonna you have to be really really good at what you do but you should never take abuse that's, that that's what but, I was the conversation that you're you're bringing up is really twofold one is a patient refusing to get blood that conversation is is going to be part of what's talked about um, I guess yet is a year and a half and a half ago as a result of the first town hall meeting listening to the students saying either microaggressions and sometimes people speak up for it, sometimes not. Hearing uh, faculty members saying, you know, I'm getting a little tired being stopped by the police because I drive a Porsche and I keep wanting to see my registration. And so why are you getting stopped? Oh, because I'm black and I have a Porsche. There was a policeman who was relieved of his duties because he happened to be stopping everybody who was black. I don't know if they're all driving Porsches, but he was doing this. But there are also the microaggressions of the students. And so what's going to be developed? very slowly, is something for all faculty and residents and students. Said, here's some videos. What would you do in this situation? What's the right thing to do in this situation? With regard to patients, there is now a policy that says if a patient looks at me and says, I don't want to be taken care of by a 70-year-old Jewish guy from New Jersey, that the attending can say, well, you know, our job is to take care of you, and we're going to do that. But if you feel that you can't deal with your emotions about this, we'll make sure you're stable, and then we'll transfer you to another hospital. So whether they don't like you because you're black, you're white, you're Jewish, you're Muslim, you're tall, you're short, have a mustache, you're clean shaven, if they say, I can't deal with this, then there is a policy that allows us to say, we're going to care for you, but as soon as you're stable, we're going to transfer you. Now there was a, another very glossy brochure from Penn State saying, is that the right answer? <clears throat> if a Muslim woman says, I really feel uncomfortable being cared for by a male, whether they're Muslim or not, could it be more sensitive to say, maybe that's a good reason to do that? So I think there needs to be a little more thought about what, whether we're going to transfer you or not. But if it's, I just don't like the way you look, then there's a policy that says, yeah, we can deal with that. It'll be made, I think, more and more public with the vignettes that are coming out. But you just need to be aware that, yeah, there are those choices. That caring for the patient is what we do. But taking abuse and caring for the patient, um, sometimes, but majority of the time, you can care for them up to a certain point and then let them make the choice as to where they would like the remainder of their care. Right. Now, and before I just to your question, Pooja. I just, so, like those are really good examples of macroaggressions and those sometimes are almost easier to deal with because you can say, you know what, like we're not gonna accept that kind of behavior. And one part of what I think you were getting at is the microaggressions are much harder. And I mean, I can tell you, I, like I have like hundreds of examples from the moment I started and you know, everybody figures out their own way to deal with it, but like that's life and that's the reality of the world that we live in right now. And you have to figure out how you're gonna deal with it. So like for me, it's that, you know, this patient might not think the best of me, but like I'm learning something from this person that then I'll move on and I'll apply to somebody else. And like, I, you just have to like learn to compartmentalize it. Maybe that's not healthy and I don't do it well all the time. I get angry a lot, but you know, unfortunately, like until we are in a place in society where we all can see each other as equal, like those things are going to exist no matter if you're a man, woman, black, white, like, like no, unless we're all the same, those things are always going to exist, those microaggressions. They're just no, not going to go away. If there was a, not a standard, but if it were witnessed by a more senior person, that there is a, a system in place to say, you know, you've just insulted this person and they're trying to take care of you. Here's a response. I think, so that, I agree. I think a lot of times it's not noticed that there is an insult going on because it's it's an underlying well, yeah, I, undertone yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, we, we, you and I walk in the hall just the other day. You know, it was borderline macro, but um, 
but you know, it's not that easy, right? I mean, you you know, there are. I mean, you, I don't. You want to tell the story? I'll but, tell that story in a second. But it's, it's a good one. That was kind of under. Kind of a question I want to get to. Yeah, I'll tell the story. Right thing. So I kind of wanted to redirect the conversation a little bit back to your initial point about the worth of diversity and the value of diversity, because I don't think that was fully flushed out, and I think that that's one of the things that I struggle with in talking to my peers. And even being on the interview trail, I'm, I'm applying in orthopedics. 99% uh, of the applicants look exactly like me, and 99% uh, of the faculty that I interview with are also exactly like me, and that's difficult. So I don't think that the conversations I've had with my peers, people in our class, I don't think a lot of people understand the, like that there is some there's value to having a different perspective and a different background, and you can say you know, that there is a moral responsibility for affirmative action because we all come from uh, different levels of privilege, and I believe in that, but I don't, I have not been able to convince people that, um, that we should value to people of different backgrounds, and, and I think that's something that's very difficult. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. So I, <clears throat> I, I think this is a, a longer conversation. Um, what I, I think just happened, though, is that they answered your question. Right? The value of diversity is answered by the common conversation that was just had by the panelists. The three of them talked about microaggressions. They talked about recruitment issues. They talked about having crucial conversations and that the ability to have those conversations is much easier if you have a diverse population with, with, within which to have those conversations. If you're a six foot four white guy with a leg brace on talking to six foot four white guys with leg braces on, you're gonna talk about being a six foot four guy, white guy with leg braces on. Right? It won't be your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Right? There's nothing wrong or right about that. But I think part of the answer is asking those who think, oh, that's not OK, or I think you're wrong, or I think there's no moral imperative there, ask them how they know that. What are the consequences if, if they're wrong versus the consequences if you're wrong? Right? The consequences if they're wrong is they don't actually learn the things they need to learn to do their job, to, to practice their training. Because it takes this diversity of discussion and opinion to do all the things we have to do to take care of patients. Because you, you probably need to have experienced talking to a person who is gay to have a sense of what might be going through the mind of a person who is gay. Although being gay is different than being lesbian, necessarily. Different conversations. You need to have enough of those conversations to know what the conversation should entail. And so I think part of the answer to your question is what just happened, is talking about the various levels of nuance that only happen when you have a diversity of thought and opinion. So that, that diversity of thought and opinion, uh, when, when I sit down to an interview and when, when you're choosing residents for your next class, right, at least in the, the places I looked at, that, you know, it's mostly just like my scores at the top of the page, my name, the University of Virginia, and maybe two or three hobbies. And is there gonna ever be a way to be able to somehow you know put a numerical value or or evaluate diversity of thought and ability to uh, empathize you know is there ever going to be a way to do that because if we don't do that I don't know if we'll ever be able to um, like actually value that beyond just checking the ethnicity box before the program directors answer and before Pooja answers and Gina will get to your point it's going to take care of itself Remember about half an hour ago, I talked about the demographics of the country. Eventually, in, in probably not my lifetime, but in your younger people's lifetimes, the people on the other side of the table are going to be brown. They're going to be a whole lot more female than they were in my generation. I mean, Scott, you, you've been around a while to know that the student body of medical students across the country is predominantly female, just a little bit, but predominantly female now. When I was a student, not so much back in the late 80s, early 90s. So the demographic of who will be on the other side of the table is changing itself. But that's why it's so imperative for us to not just wait for that to happen. We've got to have these conversations now while it's happening so that we are ready to embrace all that that means in our future. Dr. McGarry. Yeah, I, I was going to say that the, the um, you know, we're, we're, one of the most important things in the conversation that's happening here, I, I think, is that the word diversity is being used. What we're not hearing is minority. For the most part, we're not hearing affirmative action. Uh, you know, suddenly those words sound kind of different when we're talking about diversity. 
Because what diversity is implying and, and hopefully reflecting is that in fact there's a lot of diversity out there. And, and the the the, um, the um, point about uh, you know the equi equilibrium of, of, of different um, you regard race uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, underrepresented minority brown skin you you call them, but. Whatever it, it's it's about, it's all kind of you know getting into a big mixing pot, and though and as as we as we all become more aware and exposed and mix in these areas, it's a very uncomfortable process to then grow with that. But then when you do grow with it, suddenly now you get to the value. Well, if you're growing with that, you're growing with your patient population. You're figuring out programs to work with them. You're figuring out a a, uh, a, a welcoming, safe environment for all of these people to come to for their care because all of these interactions are going are to happen. Yeah. And just to use one microcosm example in terms of how you grow when you then get exposed is, you know, when I was, when I was uh, just about starting my residency, I guess this is a while back, but my, one of my brothers, I got five brothers, but one of my brothers came out as gay. And you know, in a big Irish Catholic family, that was kind of like, wait a minute, this is pretty uncomfortable. You know, and and but the fir the first answer was though, let's have the conversation. Let's make sure you, you know we love you, and let's let's make sure now that we learn, right? And so that initial discomfort <clears throat> dissipated over time, and you know, and suddenly you had an Iowa farm family and an Irish Catholic family at a wedding ceremony. You know. Uh, and all celebrating together and, and, and moving on. And now you explain how you, to your kids why you have two uncles in, in a family. And, and, and so that whole process becomes a more natural process as part of what we do. And, and I think in this, we're still, we're, we're still learning so much because so many people aren't there in whatever categories you want to put it in. Uh, and, but we're going to get there. And, and I think as an as a institution here, if we can do that and we can, we can have those conversations and we can have them meaningfully and we can hurt a little bit sometimes, we're going to hurt because we're human beings, right? Um, that, that's going to mean great things for, for people we're providing for. And then that will bring in more yeah. money. <laughs> yeah, I will. And it needs to. Dr. Jones. This is a spectacular program. And it, it's kind of music to my ears because in my lifetime I have seen a huge turnaround. And I was out for a few years and I came back here and I look at the pictures on the wall in our department, the women and the, and the brown people and in our department. I walk from my office to where I park my car and I hear three languages spoken on a regular basis. You talk now about things that are going on here and now, and I would want to say something mic, a little. Your mic is on. Yeah. A little bit different angle. I spent a lot of time thinking about the Affordable Care Act, and that, in my opinion, that is in the top three laws that have been passed in my lifetime. The Affordable Care Act addresses many of the problems that we're talking about in this session, and I would like to mention it. The Affordable Care Act established offices in CMS to look after gender disparity, look after minorities. The Affordable Care Act provided care to 20 million underprivileged people by expansion of the Medicaid program, $8 billion worth of care. The Affordable Care Act provided employment opportunities for underprivileged people. It also provided resources for professional advancement of underprivileged people to become nurses' aides, to become nurses, to become PAs, to become doctors and primary care doctors. I, I think that was probably one, one of the most humanitarian laws that we've seen. And what I'm coming to 
is my total disbelief that the United States Congress could declare war on this, declare war on, on resources for underprivileged, sick, poor, underprivileged people of all colors, all races, all genders. And our United States Congress represents us. So while we can deal with the problem in our dealing in a splendid fashion here in our own house and looking after underprivileged patients, that's our mission. We talk about that's our business, that's not our business, that's our mission. And until we can get the political leaders aligned in our country out of this dysfunctional morass, it's going to be, we, we're, we're going to have to work on ourselves, but we're going to have to work on our politicians. They don't know what they're talking about. But, but that was a, just to see the Affordable Care Act become law and for it to be enacted was a real upper for anybody that thinks seriously about the problems we're talking about now. Yeah, yes, sir, I, I would agree. Um, and I think we're, we're just about going to close down. Um, I would like to first thank our panelists um, very much, and please. In the name of omelet making, you got to break some eggs. All right, we're going to have to have a lot of really uncomfortable conversations. I deeply believe, as you say, that we have to fix our politics as a nation. That's a much bigger conversation and a much harder, harder road to hoe. I also deeply believe that the last bastion of, of these important conversations, the safe place that it has to be, has to be universities. People are shooting up everything else, right? We are, for the most part, relatively speaking, in place of safety. I think it's our obligation, and this is just Mike Williams' opinion, to radiate that safety, the safety to have these conversations, and the commitment to our mission to take care of anybody if they come with love, or with hate in their heart, or with bias no matter what they can afford to pay. I think that's who we are, that's what we have to be. And we have to become basically islands in this otherwise, this, this morass you described, Mr. Jones. I think that's our obligation. So I thank you all for your attention. Those of you who are going to the Leadership Summit, I will see you there um, very soon. And I would like to thank um, Mike Williams, Jerry Donowitz, Charlie Friel, and Pooja Shaw Berry uh, for opening this conversation for us. I think some of what we felt in the room, there are moments of discomfort. There are also moments of reaching after and learning to use a new vocabulary for all of us, and for you know raising and and uh, trying to answer questions that are urgent now and conversations that may never become easy conversations because they are going to be incorporating multiple points of view. We're always going to need to be listening and finding new ways to speak with each other. Um, this business of pushing at boundaries with worlds that we know um, and pushing beyond those boundaries sometimes to figure out where we are is a piece of our program next week. Uh, it's one of our History of the Health Sciences lectures, but it's very much here and now. Uh, 2018 happens to be the 200th anniversary of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. So next week we have a program called Mary Shelley's Frankenstein at 200. It's alive and why it still matters. And we have uh, Susan Tyler Hitchcock uh, here to talk with us. She wrote a book about Frankenstein. Uh, also first year medical student Jackie Guo. Uh, one of her favorite books is Frankenstein. And how does it read now that she's a medical student like Victor Frankenstein? So please join us next week. We will um, pay attention to announcements. We will announce what room we'll be in next week. Uh, it won't be this one. Maybe it's our usual home, uh, but we'll let you know. But again, thank you very much. And again, this was a start. Thank you for being part of it.